very good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for checking into this PPMA uh, Lunch and Learn experience. I'm delighted today to be joined by the fabulous um, Julie Osborne and colleagues from Osborne Thomas. Osborne Thomas are a huge supporter and partner of PPMA, and we're so grateful and thankful for the support they've given us over many years. And so it was a real privilege that uh, Julie agreed to come along with uh, a number of her colleagues to share with you what the world could be like um, once we navigate our way through this uh, lockdown period uh, for home-based working. Um, just a few um, little housekeeping rules. If you could make sure that uh, you keep your microphone on mute and also if you take off your video connection that would be fantastic for us. If you want to ask any questions through the course of um, the debate then please use the chat facility and we'll pick those up with you and uh, we'll be finished around 12 30 or thereabouts so before i hand over to julie what i've been asking all of our guests who joined us on these broadcasts is the uh the thing that they found personally either challenging or really surprising about themselves through this period of lockdown and i'm sure there are many that julie will be able to share with us in terms of interests uh, and experiences julie Lovely to see you, and uh, what is it that you're going to share with us today? Well, I think the biggest thing I've realised is I've got no hobbies. That right. uh, yeah. my time is taken up on socialising, going out and working. Um, so when people have been doing things like painting and God knows what else they've been doing, and it's all creative, I've been sitting there twiddling in my thumbs thinking, I don't do anything like that. Um, I've tried to start learning a language. That didn't go very well. I tried to start doing training every day. That didn't go very well. So I basically gave up on all of it and reverted back to just being me. Well, that's the best, best thing, isn't it? You know, trying to be something you're not. You know, it's often one of those big challenges. And, you know, I know that I've uh, been attempting to you know, have in a new uh, keep fit regime myself. And it's, uh, anyway, it's not worked. So right, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing and uh, I'm just going to hand over to you yourselves and I'll catch up with everybody at the end. Uh, thank you so much again. Thank you, Lethem. Uh, I think it's great that PPMA are doing this um, to keep us all connected a bit more. Um, I just want to introduce the panel here that we've got. So the only people that you can see, um, Kate Harper. Um, Kate gives market insight and service design specialist um, across the market and across the public sector particularly. Uh, Miriam Burton is a specialist around assessment and development um, and Kate Wilson is a client development consultant. What we're trying to do here rather than do lots of slides and more Zoom things that lots of people are doing at the moment is trying to create a debate between us on the, the topic of when home working becomes the norm. So if you were going to design an agile workforce you wouldn't design it on a Sunday and implement it on a Monday, which is basically what's happened to all of us. We had to go from one thing to something else overnight. And that's affected the people that work for us and also how we're looking at the people that work for us as well. So our debate here today is very much around how do we bring those people back in um, and what's the best way of doing it. So I'm going to hand over in the first instance to Kate Harper. Um, and to take that question, Kate, you know, where are we now? Uh, lots of people are home working, and over the next few weeks, people are going to need to start coming back into the new norm. Yes, um, and, and, and that indeed is, is, is the big challenge and the big question, isn't it? <laughs> Excuse me. How do, how do we get to the new normal? Um, and the organisations that I'm working with at the moment, I think the first thing that is really notice noticeable is there's no one size fits all. And I think, you know, we, we, we see every day in the media and we've seen over the last couple of weeks, you know, suggestions of splitting into two sections and teams and we do, you know, three day split shifts and all the rest of it. And, and those things are great ideas. And in some organisations, that kind of approach may work really, really well. The reality is in other organisations, that kind of approach may work really, really badly. And also that approach can work well for some individuals, but work quite badly for, for other individuals. 
And therefore, uh, you know, I think the starting point has to be to understand, as organisations to truly understand their, their workforce, their teams, how work is, how work is operated. I mean, this, in some ways, this whole thing is kind of um, reminiscent of what happened back in 2008. And, you know, we, we, we hit an economic crisis in the country. Many businesses were beset by problems of saying, you know, I can't afford the whole of my workforce. What, what are we now going to do? And it was really an interesting time in 2008 with businesses that said, well, rather than just have a blanket sweep or just make redundancies, we don't know how long this is going to last. And let's see if we can actually survive this, this whole time. And I think the companies that survived the best were the ones that um, involved their workforce and really understood um, and shared the problem with their workforce. So I think many organisations were really surprised at just how much you know, interesting information came out from the workers. So they posed the problem to the workers and their teams and said, right, this is the problem we've got. This is the money in the pot. You know, this is what we, this is, you know, what we've got. We don't want to make people redundant. What are we going to do? And, and organisations and, and, and their people were able to come up with some really innovative solutions. And I think we're finding that now. And organisations that are going to their people, asking the right questions, getting teams to work together, even though they're remote, um, creating environments where people can solve problems. Um, we're seeing some really great innovative practice. Uh, and it's different everywhere. So from my perspective, the starting point has to be get people involved, go and ask the questions. And that's not just a simple questionnaire to say, you know, is your IT working? Can you come back? Have you, have you got child, children of school age? You know, the, if, if the schools don't go back, you won't be able to come back to work. That's practical stuff. That's great. You need to know it. But it's also if you're going out and, and asking questions, be creative and, and, and enable your staff to design their own solutions because I bet you can bet your bottom dollar they will design some more creative solutions than just managers sitting in an office trying to come up with those ideas themselves. Okay, thanks, thanks for that, Kate. From a sort of um, a profiling assessment point of view, Miriam, you know, given what Kate's just been saying, what what tools are out there in the market that can aid that? I'm not sure that there's anything specific around, you know, how to design an organisation or anything like that. I mean, you as HR professionals, you're far more clued up to that than perhaps I am. I think the key for me is understanding your people at an individual level. Um, so we say agile working and we assume that everybody can buy into that and just do that. But there's been quite a lot of research really since lockdown started over in Southeast Asia from some of the big test companies like Hogan, like, um, well, Hogan's one of the big ones and Hograffer to look at the individual and then look at that from that perspective and how they cope with agile working. So there's some real personality traits that lend themselves perfectly to remote working. There are others that people can cope, but you will start seeing some odd signs maybe that they are not coping very well <clears throat> or that there's an issue. So an example is for those of you who know the Hogan Development Survey, which looks at unhelpful behaviors in the workplace, you kind of think, okay, well, how do I know about those um, if they're working from home? But there, there are some, mag they tend to be magnified, they tend to be shown much more quickly. So if you're interacting with someone and they're not performing as they would normally do, or they just seem a bit odd, it's going to be a really good clue, clue that things are not really working that well. That's obvious, it's not rocket science. What's more interesting is what do you do for your recruitment going forwards? How are you going to get that level of understanding of people through your recruitment process so that if we are carrying, going to carry on working this way, you can preempt any potential behavioral issues, performance issues by understanding um, what drives people. And there are just so many different tools out there. I mean, a lot of you will be familiar with WAVE, but there's a whole load of other range of tools that look at drivers and motivation, because I think that's going to become much more key now, other than, uh, rather than just, are you technically competent and do you have the kind of right sort of behaviours? I think we need to get underneath that now and actually start looking at drivers, motivation, values, to see how people are, are likely to adapt to the work environment that we're bringing them into. Okay, thank you. 
I think we've got we've got two or three more weeks when we can start to look at excuse the lockdown here and um, <laughs> keep doing that with it and flicking it out of the way. Um, we have two or three more weeks now to have a look at um, what we're going to do, who needs to come back, how we're going to bring those people back. So starting with asking the people that are out there um, more pertinent questions on how are they going to do that? When can they do that? What's feasible for them? We could start that process now. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I mean, I'm doing some work with, with a client at the moment where they're about to recruit into quite, an, not a niche role, but it's a managerial role, but it's in a particular service area. It's actually the coroner's service. And they've had lots of issues because the very nature of working in that environment is really challenging and it's obviously been increased. And they're seeing some really challenging behaviors um, because people are working under stress, they don't have the normal support environment in, in the team, in the office. They're about to recruit another uh, manager. And we've been looking at using something called NEO, which is looks at the foundations of personality. We've gone through with the current managers to identify which attributes they think are important what would work, what wouldn't work, what would be, okay, we can manage with that, but this would be a real challenge for us. And then we're using that as our benchmark and as our kind of template almost uh, of, for the behavioral characteristics that we're looking for in a future manager. And I don't want it to sound as though we're looking for a clone because we really aren't, but we just want to understand the person in their entirety. And that includes the foundations of their personality, the building blocks that make them behave the way that they do. So that's a really good example. And then the other beauty of that is, of course, it feeds into personal development plans, onboarding, personal development, and it becomes a, a thread. We all talk about this common thread through recruitment, through to development. It doesn't often happen, but I think it's going to be even more critical now, given the unusual circumstances in which we work, really critical. There's um, quite an interesting question that's come in uh, that might be relevant to this point is can, you know, can people be coached to be better in coping with home based working or remote working? Are there any things out there that we can be giving support to people with? Yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of stuff, uh, well-being stuff um, online. Um, that, but fundamentally, um, there has to be a good relationship between the individual and their manager or the individual and whoever is kind of keeping an eye on their progress, and making that regular contact, because they need to be able to say, be really open about what they're feeling. And all the, the research that I've read about coping with lockdown and coping with working at home is all about recognizing that nobody is going to behave in the same way and that just because i don't behave in the same way say as julie or kate doesn't make how i'm feeling any less valid and so um i think it's really important that um we try and create that openness and perhaps the questionnaire that kate's been talking about about how to design your job how, what's what have been the inhibitors to you doing your job what's been um what's helped you and then what can the organization or what can your manager do to help you um, i'm not a well-being expert but i have um through using neo and through using the hogan development survey been very very um specific about the coaching needs that some people that i've worked with have required and coaching is on a whole gamut from mentoring at its simplest right through almost therapeutic or uh, yeah therapeutic type um, coaching which borders on counseling and actually there are coaches who sit across that whole gamut um, but there's also online tools for people who just want a bit of help there's enough online tools there around well-being looking after yourself I mean the NHS has a brilliant tool called just every mind matters and it's very much directed at mental health but actually the t what, what it talks about is really applicable for anybody who's struggling to work remotely. Julie? Yeah, I think there's, I think there's also a case here of um, hiring manager training. Mm -hmm. um, you're dealing with a community that has, has been used to having everybody there and around them. Um, to suddenly go to remote working for a hiring manager and for somebody who is managing a team of people, that can be quite challenging as well. Um, and uh, I think there's areas within inside all of that that will need coaching and help to get those people in the right frame of mind to be able to do it. It is a mindset, yeah. definitely a mindset of being able to cope with that team being um, not next to you, uh, but also how do you manage those teams effectively moving forward? Um, 
But I think starting right at the starting point of this, it's over the next few weeks, we're going to have to start to look at how we get back to some kind of norm and utilising some form of questionnaire out into that community to say a bigger thing, as you were saying, Miriam, and asking bigger questions will allow us to identify the people who are able to just go, yeah, no problem, that's fine for me, and others who are going to need more support in able to do that. Yeah. And as I say, going forwards, we have a perfect opportunity to start with that information without having to do a questionnaire, because when you're recruiting people, you can do that in advance. Um, you can do that to help your recruitment decisions, but then, as I said, you can use it as a golden thread all the way through. Okay. I think um, one of the questions that was um, raised actually at the um, PPMA um, Shires group that we did the other day um, that came out of it was actually there are opportunities in all of this. Okay. I think sometimes everybody's looking at the negative aspect of it, but there are actually opportunities, particularly in the agile workspace, if you're looking to recruit uh, and you're looking to recruit longer term, you're going to have a much bigger field by being much more agile. Um, so it's not that you are in Surrey, was actually the lady who mentioned this. Uh, you're not in Surrey, you don't have to be in Surrey. Um, and when there are difficult to recruit areas, and I think the example that was given, uh, Kate Wilson, I think it was lawyers. Um, yeah. And they're recruiting from um, Northamptonshire and they're going to be home based. They didn't need to be in that environment. So looking at the wider thing longer term could really help. So this has given us an opportunity which most organisations would not have gone to anywhere near as quickly as it happened to us. Uh, and probably have been a tad more well thought through than the opportunity we were given to do this. Um, but equally, there are some opportunities out there. There are some opportunities to get to a wider field of candidates going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Just on, on that point, I've been doing some work with an organisation who was struggling to do, um, struggled for many years in terms of out of hours. They were providing an out of hours service and they always struggled to, um, to, to resource the out of hours service. Now they've enabled their staff to work from home. <laughs> they have more people than they can cope with signing up for the after hours uh, set, you know, um, shifts because it's so much easier for them. They don't have to travel into a workplace. It's a kind of contact center. They don't have to travel into a workplace. And they actually realized that the real barrier to the out of hours were people going in when it was dark, especially in the winter. They didn't want to travel. They didn't want to be on public transport to go into a workplace uh, out of hours sitting in their own home office now that they have the technology to do that not a problem mm. they can make those hours available and and the organization has found you know a completely different mindset um around around out of hours working and i think it's those sorts of things that are exactly what you're talking about julie that you know the, the opportunities from agile and really being able to explore what it is you know what what those barriers and issues are are really coming to the fore in this environment Julia, I was just going to say something that just occurred to me. Um, before this all happened, the big thing was about agile working, hot desking, not having your own desk. And of course, now that goes completely against social distancing, doesn't it? And you think, well, what's your alternative? And actually, the alternative is to get people comfortable with being at home where that's possible um, and facilitating that. Because it just, just struck me that actually agile working means different things for different people. And the, the, what, what has been discussed, or in my experience before uh, all of this happened, was it was about taking people out of the organisation, but when they had to come just hot desking, well, how do we deal with that? I mean, I haven't even begun to get my head around that one. There's a question that's come in with regards to large scale businesses. Can we think of a, a role model where remote working perhaps works more effectively? And do we know anyone who has done that and why we think it works well? Julie? I can't say whether it's worked well or not because obviously they're in, they're in early stages of doing this but a lot of big organisations have taken not quite the government's um, edict that they came out with the other day with this um, A team and B team and someone comes in on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and somebody else comes in on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They've done it in weeks. Mm. What they've done is they've said okay for the next two weeks 
this 50% of department A will be in. At the end of that two weeks, we will disinfect everywhere. We will do this, we will do that before team B comes in for two weeks. That doesn't mean team A isn't working, they're working from home, but they want to ensure that that social interaction that people are so used to in a working environment still continues. So it's early days, has it worked? It's worked as in people's mental health is better because they know where they stand in all of that. I think time will tell in terms of what they've produced during that period. I think that's too early to give an indication of that. But in terms of an idea, that for me was probably one of the best ideas I'd heard and the best way of controlling it. Mm. Kate? Oh, I've been working with an organisation, it's actually a manufacturing organisation, and um, I mean, completely sort of different way of looking at things, but they've almost gone back to the old fashioned time and motion studies and looking at the whole flow of work through a production line and through a, through a channel to say, how do we make, how do we maximise social distancing? And in probably 90% of their workflow, they can actually maintain social distancing. There are some areas where they can't and they're putting, uh, you know, remedial action in there. So they're putting screens in, they're putting, you know, people wearing masks and PPE. Um, but it does go back to that kind of really old fashioned, let's break the work down into its constituent parts and let's understand how people work as much as what they do, how they do it and work with different groups and teams to try and maintain the best way of doing that, whether it's in a workplace or, as, as you say, in some instances, if people can work remotely for part of their time to do that. But it is breaking work down into its constituent parts. It, it goes back to this, where we started this conversation, which is actually who knows the jobs best. It's probably the people doing the jobs. And actually, do you know, given the uh, permission almost, to create their jobs, you might actually find that there will be some efficiencies that come out of it. Why are we always doing it this way when actually if we did this, we'd save 50% of our time. So it's a brilliant opportunity to keep going down that agile journey that we started before lockdown, looking at efficiencies, looking at better ways of doing things because actually needs must. And you know what they say, um, necessity is the mother of invention. I think this is a classic example. Well, Thank you. I'm a, I am just conscious of the time uh, because that half an hour went very fast. Um, I think more than anything, what it shows you is, is that four people who deal in recruitment can talk a lot. Uh, <laughs> <yeah. Good. laughs> I hope you found that interesting. I think the, the biggest thing for us was to try and get out there that we need to ask our people, um, whatever way that is before we start to resume a new norm. Um, going off in a small huddle and deciding for that mass of people is not necessarily the right thing to do and the right way to go. Um, so going back to the starting point of saying, what has worked for you? What hasn't worked for you? And taking that premise will help those people return back into the workplace. Lethem, over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Julie and the panel for that great session. Lots of uh, really useful information and ideas and tips that you shared with us and um, plenty of food for thought for me in terms of future programs to invite you back on. I particular, particularly like that um, idea about how can you, how could we be working remotely with colleagues who, as Miriam was saying, have the answer themselves. So mm -hmm. how do you engage with them at this point, you know, at a point when we need to be talking to them to help reshape and rethink that different world and, you know, the, the way forward for us. So I think, uh, yeah, we'll be in touch with you and hopefully see you again in the not too distant future. Uh, for you, you out there, oh, you would be great to have you with us, as always. <laughs> uh, for everyone out there, many thanks for tuning in. And uh, also, for those who have downloaded the broadcast, thank you for doing so. We've got some great um, sessions lined up for you in coming weeks. Uh, check out our daily mindfulness sessions, which are 7.45 every weekday. And we've got a program coming up about how do you present of your best online. You know, certainly for those individuals who are having to facilitate, perhaps go for interviews, present. This is a huge mm. skill that people have got to uh, acquire. And therefore, we're going to put together a half hour kind of uh, top tips session for you there. And we've also got clear review coming up in the, uh, in the next week, uh, talking about uh, the importance of performance conversations and home based working. So many thanks to you all. Once again, a huge thanks to Osborne Thomas for their support and their participation today and sending love to you and thanks as ever 
to you out there for the, all of the work that you're doing on behalf of the HR profession. See you again soon. Bye for now. Bye-bye.